Welcome everybody. I'll just let everyone get settled in here. And I just want to tell you a little bit about what Artful Minds is. Artful Minds focuses on the artist's artistic development and growth by providing exercises, inspiration, instruction, guidance, discussion, and feedback all in one place. We do this with our skill development exercises, our weekly open office hours, monthly challenges, monthly critiques, inspirational interviews, and some upcoming master classes. If you want to check us out, head on over to artfulminds.ca, or if you want to see the public aspect of the community where you can find previous inspirational interviews, head on over to community.artfulminds.ca. And with that, I will also spotlight Mark. So inspirational discussion today is with Mark D'Alessio. He's an American naturalist painter whose modern interpretation of nature is a reflection on and study of the natural world. You can find him at markdalessio.com and on Instagram, his handle is uh, mark underscore D'Alessio. Uh, welcome, Mark. How are you doing? Thank you very much for this interview. Thanks for having me. As I go through some images here of your work, it would be awesome if you can introduce yourself in your own words. So yeah, I'm... Uh naturalistic painter. I'm originally from the United States, but I've lived in Europe for the last 30 years now. And um, I originally left the U.S. because I was, I wanted to learn sort of traditional oil painting. And I didn't think, I didn't know at the time of anyone who could teach me in the United States. It was you know, back in the days before the internet. I came to Europe and ended up in Florence where Ironically enough, I ended up studying with an American and it was actually the Americans who really kept a lot of these traditions alive. And so I studied with Charles Cecil in his school on and off for probably student there for three or four years. And then I stayed and taught for another four or five years at the school. And I was always interested in naturalistic painting ever since I was a you know, young man. I always just, I was a felt this great reverence for the world around me. I originally studied biology because I thought that was a really good way of expressing my love of the natural world. But then when I discovered, I'd always drawn and painted. I just didn't think it was a very serious um, profession. And then when I was in college, I actually studied biology. And then I realized that biology was also going to be a very difficult profession. And at the same time, I discovered I had a couple of really great art teachers at UC Santa Cruz. And they, one of them taught uh, Kind of a academic drawing and the other one taught sort of a Californian Impressionism uh, landscape painting. Californian Impressionism, a lot of the artists, because of the earthquake in 1906, a lot of uh, these top tier painters had moved to the Monterey Bay and had created this sort of school of Californian Impressionism. When at the time I was at UC Santa Cruz and so that was really what the, the teachers were kind of interested in and it was something a lot of the students were interested in and something it was kind of a model to to look at and, and since we had all these views around us I got really into landscape painting and then when I went to Florence it was more of a portrait uh, training because that was the I think it's a much better way to I think studio painting is you know it tends to be much more figure and portrait and not a lot of Landscape painting. Landscape painting is hard to teach in a school environment because of the weather and probably more so in Canada. But anyways, I became something of a portrait painter and that was how I started my career. But then I discovered that I saw some painting, some exhibitions by um, Joe McGurl, well, mainly the Joe McGurl show in New York. And I was just amazed that somebody could paint such beautiful landscapes today and, and sell them in New York began to focus more on landscapes and got into some galleries and switched, painted less and less portraits and more and more landscapes. Interesting. Do you, do you find there's a translatable piece from doing a lot of portraits to moving to landscapes or was it all, was it all just something new? I was doing portraits from life and painting people who did not have a lot of time to sit. And so you had to be really fast. And I think that translates very well into landscape painting where the effects are moving quickly. So I think that part, and I mean, uh, studio painters often struggle when they go outside for the first time because you can't control any, you know, you lose sort of control of a lot of stuff. And working as a commissioned portrait painter, you're not in control a lot of the time too, you know, you have clients and difficult clients and difficult settings to work with. And so it can be uh, in that way, portraiture and landscape, this thing about having to be fast and not uh, being entirely in control of your setting translate well into landscaping. Gotcha. So for you, it worked out well, didn't it? 
Yeah, I mean, I love, I really love just being outside. And so, do you paint exclusively from life, though, or when you time to do the studio pieces, you work from your plein air piece and some photos at the same time? I have photos uh, with me when I'm doing the enlarging my sketches, but I've never, I've tried painting a painting just you know, start to finish from a photo and they, they, they never work. It's, it's funny too, because they look really impressionistic. And then when I paint from life, they tend to look much more photographic. And so people think I paint from photos when it's like, Oh, that's interesting. I mean, I guess just, it's just because of the nature of what you're using, the medium you're painting from, right? But I think also painting outside, you have this incredible amount of information that you're kind of whittling down and focusing on what's important. Whereas when you're working from a photo, you have much less information and you're kind of expanding out from it. So I think it's a different mm. skill set. And I think there's good painters who paint from photos. But I think a lot of the artists who I see who work from photos really well, there's a Russian uh, portrait painter named Yevgeny Gruzchev. I saw a little painting he did from a, a very small black and white photo from World War I. He did a big, you know, full-sized uh, color portrait. And it just you know, look so full of life. And I think what a lot of them are, and, and the same if you look at Soroya, the way he was handling, you know, there's little etchings, you can see sometimes the photo, and then the etching that he did from the photo, and the same with Norman Rockwell, you see his photos, and then you see the finished painting. And if you look at them carefully, what they were doing was they weren't copying sort of the flat shapes of the photo from the photo to the painting. They were imagining the form in their head. I actually don't know if Evgeny does this, but that's how I imagine it's a much from looking at these great artists where you can see the photo and the finished product. It looks like they're using the, the photo as a springboard and then imagining it all in their head, visualizing the, the form in their head and then, and then painting that. Whereas I, because I've come from this naturalistic method where I look at something, especially using sight size, where you're used to sort of seeing, you know, an image and then copying it exact, I would always do it that way with the photo. And it, it just didn't work for me. So that's interesting. I never thought about painting that way. And that makes sense because then you're not just copying a flat plane on a flat plane. You're, uh, you're what you're doing is you're transcribing into a form and you're using that form to create your painting. That's a great way to think about that. Yeah. And I mean, Norman Rockwell's work, you can see some of his the photos and then the finished work and it's just interesting how inventive he was and how it's not at all just uh, copying the, the photograph yeah that's right that's cool i think it's a different way of seeing and perhaps too because we're we see so many you know two-dimensional images today whereas it used to be much less common but he was a very creative individual that's for sure without a doubt yeah but yeah. i think it was also part of the training that they had a visual imagination that that i certainly don't have so. yeah could be individual too, right? He could be just a unique one out of the many, right? Yeah, I think, I mean, I remember reading a book, this isn't really art related, but a book, a really fascinating book called The Art of Memory, where it talked about how there used to be a whole school of ways of memorizing. People wouldn't, might not see books that often. So they had developed all these tools for memorization, which often involved visualizing spaces and you would walk around the church in your head and imagine yourself putting information in a drawer and a column and stuff and then when you needed to remember you would go back and re-visualize and I think I don't really spend a lot of time visually visualizing spaces in my head I think because we're just bombarded with images yeah that's right I think it might have been something that was more common before too that's know. interesting yeah for sure and so you mentioned something about sight sizing and you pretty much do everything through sight sizing, correct? You did your you, your portraits through sight sizing, and you do a lot. Yeah. Well, I think all your landscapes, except the studio stuff, through sight sizing, right? Yeah, I mean, like I say, sight size was what we learned for uh, portraiture, and it's kind of there's an interesting discussion about how old sight size is because nobody really knows when it was invented. To me, it seems quite obvious that it's you know a very easy way to work to get your shapes right and find it hard to believe it was invented in the 20th century but it's possible it was but it, for portraiture sight size was invaluable because you had to be really fast and really accurate you know after the first half hour client is already you know they're on their first break and they want to see what you're doing and it was really important that you were accurate and fast and it just saves you doing all the mental calculations of sizes and everything and so then when I went outside, I 
you know, I kept, it was interesting because we actually, my teacher who taught us, Charles Cecil taught us sight size portraiture. He claimed that nobody was using sight size outside, either mm -hmm. impossible to do, or I don't even think he really did. But uh, Joe McGraw, ironically enough, who so inspired me before I knew anything about him, has also developed a system of using sight size outside with a, he actually has a frame you can buy that you attach to your board and it's the same size. Yeah, so I started doing sight size and then figured out a system and it works really well. But to me, it's interesting because long before this, when I was in studying biology, there was this idea in biology that a biologist was basically uh, nature studying itself. The idea that, that humans are part of nature and then we're studying nature. And so it's kind of nature trying to understand itself in a way and but I thought, I always loved that there was this sort of humility in that. And then when I went to Florence, uh, Charles taught us a lot about the Neoplatonist. And I was reading Pico della Mirandola, and he had a very similar idea about how God, how man was God basically revering himself. God had created all this beautiful <laughs> things, and he needed somebody to, you know, worship it and revere it. But man is part of God. And, and so for me, I always kind of felt like the artist was, in a way, nature revering itself. We're part of the natural world. Yeah. We go outside, we fall in love with this, you know, everything around us. But we are also part of that. And it's quite interesting that we're so inspired by what is essentially part of ourselves. And so this reverence for the natural world and the natural world revering itself through the artist was something that I was always interested in even before I started sight sizing. And then when I began to use sight size, to me, it was just the way I was interested in trying to remove any style. I didn't want to have a, a personal style. I wanted to try to be sort of nature revering itself by painting. And so I wanted it to be as immediate, the natural world put onto this canvas. The part I was adding to it would have been the design mainly, but mm -hmm. everything else was my idea, the selection of the subject matter and the design was obviously very important and uh, personal, but I was trying to have as little as my, of myself in the painting. And so side size worked very well for that because it was sort of like letting the painting paint itself. Yeah, I could definitely see that. And then in, in the end, a style of four, you did come out it's just not as apparent as, say, someone who is more of an impressionistic painter or uses palette knife or something like that. And what I find about the sight size method for you is when I watch you paint on YouTube, if you haven't seen Mark has a YouTube channel, you should just uh, search for his name and check it out. He has a lot of great videos. But with many of them, when you're sight sizing, um, I, I get that aspect of it. But because of, of what you're doing, it's being, I don't want to say copied very well, it's being um, uh, interpreted very well. And it Sometimes it really hurts my brain because you have a distinct way to mix, you know, the right hue uh, in the right value with the right temperature, place it down on your canvas and then kind of move on. And it, it it's just surreal to watch you paint because you, you bring everything in and everything is so accurate. But I wanted to ask you, when you do this, is your focus more just on the value or are you trying to get other aspects of the color in there as well? I mean, I think it was just the camp who said that value was, get the values right and nothing else matters. I mean, to me, I was always taught that the values were the most important thing. You know, if you look at a black and white painting, I mean, a black and white photograph of a painting, you can tell if it's a good painting or not. And all you have are the values. So I think values are definitely the most important thing to me in the painting. And after that, the colors are sort of, you know, the, the values, if you take, you know, a piece of jazz music, you know, the, the values are sort of the, the structure of the song and the, the color would be kind of the solo. You know, you can play with the color and have it be more personal and more interesting, but I tend to not be as concerned with accuracy in my colors. I tend to be much more concerned with accuracy in the values and then the colors for me are just kind of fun. Um, and I play with them and I I look at what's there, but then I invent and I tweak and I, I mess around. I use a very limited palette, which I think makes color mixing much more easy. I use just two yellows, uh, two reds. Right now I'm using three blues. And then I recently put orange. And then I also use a yellow ochre because it's just a nice shortcut. 
But I think having a very, very limited palette and then just getting to know those colors very well allows you to get colors and keep them quite sort of compressed in a way. And so yeah. I think the colors are not getting confused with 30 colors on the palette. And I mean, this painter is producing great work with 30 colors, but to me, it's, I used to put a lot more colors on. I used to put a viridium and I put a, an earth red and I would just find that I had no, you know, at the end of the day, I hadn't touched them. And I would dutifully put them out because my teacher told us that we needed those colors on our palette. And I you know, put them out for years and just never used them. And then finally just stopped. <laughs> it's funny, eh? You're just wasting paint more or less, right? Yeah. Yeah, no but doubt. I think, I kept thinking maybe I will need it sometime. So I've, I've started with a much larger palette that my teacher said was what we should be using. And then I whittled it down to... Yeah what I and I added a few things too I use a cobalt blue because I found so I spent so much time mixing ultramarine and cerulean that, and then the same I started adding orange because we were painting on a citrus farm once in Sicily and we could not mix an orange bright enough even in the shadows um, so we I went and bought orange and, and it stayed on your palette ever since is yeah, that right it's oh, wonderful that for I want, it's wonderful for glazing and and also for getting it's funny because like the red the the clouds just above the horizon often have a warmth to them but because of the titanium white if you use just a even a vermilion which is quite warm it'll always be a bit too cool whereas mm. if you use orange it'll look red but it's almost a perfect hue so would you say that then really your process is value first then temperature and then the hue when you see i when was taught never to think about temperature and i oh, never think about it. really well that's interesting just color you say it's bluer it's greener it's redder it's yellower it's funny because i had to learn temperature later because the students would always ask me does this need to be warmer does this need to be cooler students who had studied in other schools wow that blows my mind and so, yeah, we wouldn't talk about temperature at all. Do you have it now? Do you think about temperature now, nowadays? No, really? No, no I eh? still think about hue. Is it really, does it need to be greener or redder? Wow. But, but back to your question, do I go in this order? I, I mean, I think over the last five years, one thing that has become much more interesting to me is the overall design. And so that I really start with, to me, the most important thing is the design of mainly the big shapes. And then even as you get into the details, I think the design of smaller forms becomes much more important. And then after that, I would say uh, value and then color. Interesting. Okay. Man, yeah. Okay. I don't know if I could think like that. I'm just so ingrained in temperature. Maybe it's an Achilles heel for me then. Interesting. No, I mean, there are lots of, I think that's much more common to think of temperature. And I didn't even realize it was strange the way I was taught until I started talking to other artists. But the thing is that if you, if you do temperature, you say, okay, it's warmer, it's cooler. You, you're just, the next question is, okay, then what color is it? <laughs> you're just skipping that question. Yeah, I guess you got me there. Like, you're to make it warmer, what are you going to do? You can add your yellow or your orange. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, so yeah. good point. Yeah, even with a Zorn palette, you would have options for making it warmer or cooler, wouldn't you? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just at some point you have to color get the colors. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You got me there. Isn't that interesting? I think my mind just exploded. <laughs> so I, I want to ask you the big question here, and I'll just show a couple of pictures. I know you have a, you put together something which is wonderful, but it's for everybody watching. The main question is, what is your process for enlarging a plein air piece to to a, into a studio piece? Because here we have a beautiful plein air piece. No, this yeah, is the plein air piece. Yeah, that's the plein air piece. And then you move into a studio piece. And it's similar, but it is a lot more detail. Um, and I, I guess that's my question is, is it just a matter of refining your shapes to smaller nuances of value and color? And so I'll stop sharing. And if you want to bring up your screen, that'd be wonderful and talk about it. So, I mean, this is interesting because this was a sketch I did. It was a very windy location up on this hill and I couldn't go out with a big canvas. I would much prefer just to work on the spot and actually, the reason why I won't use the two examples that you showed is because both of those were done, both of those paintings were started large on site and were not uh, studio paintings. Oh, okay. So, but this one is an example of a painting that was done entirely in the studio. And so 
here I, I wanted to go out with a big canvas. I couldn't because of the wind. And then this is the uh, finished piece. So there's a lot more detail in it. And I mean, one thing that I find interesting is you see in this middle section here, it's quite long. Whereas in the sketch, I've shortened that because I, need, I knew I was going to do a studio piece and I needed this information and this information, but I couldn't fit it all on my little board. And so I just kind of shrunk it down and then did the large studio piece. Now, another example here is I did this little sketch on the spot. The main sketch down here, you know, I then did this little uh, study on the spot and then I did a very large studio piece here. You can see it in our studio uh, from the, my little, from the plein air sketch and also from this thumbnail. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a drawing for the Dordogne painting, but what I wanted to say is here. Now, obviously, I have a lot more information here and here and here that isn't in my sketch. And so what I'm doing with that is I'm using photos to sort of expand out. But the problem I have with the photography is that I don't trust it for the shapes. I don't trust it for the colors. I don't trust it for the values. And since I have my little sketch there and I have a photo of the central part, I can see just how unreliable or how different, let's say, the photo is from what I want to paint. And so using that, I can kind of say, okay, well, down here, you know, I know how the central area differs. So I can also sort of calculate what's in the photo, but I really, I invent a lot. I don't, like I said, I've realized that if I paint what I see in a photo directly onto the painting, it doesn't work. So I try to reimagine in my head, you know, the form of the grass and trying to do what I was never taught by anyone, but I talking about earlier, what I've, think other artists were doing in the past and, and some artists today trying to reimagine the form. A lot of times I'll just invent trees too. I mean, I think the, a lot of these fields aren't exactly what was there in nature. You know, I play around with it. I tend to be much more sort of, you know, when I just enlarge a sketch, the parts that I have uh, in the sketch, I tend to be much more loyal to in my sketch. But when I get sort of off into the sides and, and like certainly the sky. For example, there was no day that I had, I don't, I didn't have any photograph of those clouds. So I would, a lot of it is me just playing and inventing and trying to create a painting and not just expand out from the photo. But I do have the photos there if I get stuck or if, and, and also I, I have very detailed drawings. I mean, not too detailed, but sort of this level of, of drawing I will have for the shapes, you know, of where the cliff is and, and stuff, because like I said, I just can't trust the photos and you can't really trust the photos for the, you know, even the planes, you know, if you take a photo of sort of the ground here and then you take a photo of the ground here, you're never gonna get the way your eye sees those, you know, in nature as if you were standing there. You're going to get the camera, you know, sort of focused on that and then the camera focused on that. So I'm trying to lose the camera as much as possible and, and basically invent uh, what I think a landscape should look like. So, yeah, gotcha. well, we, we definitely know it's been 30 minutes with the church bell in the background. Yeah, it's, it's going to go again, too. <laughs> um, I mean, you're the first artist alive that I've heard. So we're going to, have to open it up to questions in a second. But the, you're the first artist that I've heard that said that they can't trust the shape from a photo. I and mean, I thought that was very interesting. And yeah, the camera distorts shapes depending on the focal length of the lens without a doubt. But you're the first one I ever heard that says you can't trust the shapes from a photo. I thought that was I even go out, you know, I have the... Uh what are they, the prime zoom lenses, you know, I try to do everything I can to uh, keep the shapes as accurate as possible, but I just, yeah. I always will have my sketch and the photo of the center of the painting for reference. And I can just see that everything is completely different than how I painted it. Yeah. And how I remember it. So. That's interesting. And they also do additional sketches of what it looks like to you. So when you can go back to enlarge it, you're not, you have a definitive reference instead of just like you say, something that that camera took. I, I really like that idea. Yeah, I, I, I need the drawing. Like I yeah. can't invent the whole design. I just don't have the experience. I've spent now, you know, 10 years blowing up landscapes, but I've always used my own drawing and I'm not, yeah, I just can't 
take a bunch of photos and invent the drawing. It just, it doesn't inspire me. It's, I get kind of lost. I don't trust what I'm looking at and, yeah. and I don't feel comfortable. So, yeah, well, I'm going to have to definitely try that too. Cause I've fell into the same trap. I get back trying to enlarge something and I'm looking at the photo and it just, I'm lost for one. And then what am I going to do or how's it look? Love that piece of advice. And what I what I find fascinating about your work, and I, I it's, and this is part of what I consider your style is your skies. There is limited sky here, but a lot of your other even larger ones that you've done out, or your other planar pieces that you've done, your skies are just quick brushes of the correct value, and it just again, yeah, it just breaks my brain on how this even works. This is, a, this is entirely planar, but the, yeah, but you still have the vertical strokes within the within the planar piece. But when you go to your studio piece, you still have this scratchy, strokey sky and it, it it works it's not distracting at all from the piece and it must be well accepted from your patrons because you're selling your studio pieces um do you, do you ever get any feedback regarding these large brush strokes in the sky yeah i've actually had galleries complain and ask me to <laughs> polish them but um the broken brushwork in the sky comes from uh Daubigny, the french painter I mean, the impressionists obviously did as well, but if you look at Daubigny's skies, he's, he really went all in with the, with the broken brushwork in the sky. And to me, it always read more like air. Mm -hmm. right? That there isn't any sort of thing you can grab onto and this gives you the sense of the movement of the wind and the, the air. So I started developing after seeing his paintings and that's where it comes from. So yeah, I think that's a very good explanation of it. It makes you feel like there's atmosphere and there's air and like, like you copying him. Once I saw that, I started using just a lot of quick brush strokes for my skies and they seem more fresh. They seem less contrived, right? It just, it changes the whole perception of the piece. Yeah. I remember just going through museums and seeing his skies and then seeing these other skies where it was a perfect gradation. And mm -hmm. to me, his really just, felt like there was you could really feel the atmosphere in the painting so that's perfect uh okay we're a little bit over but since you have this this painting up here um, i'm going to talk about it and let's see if i can get it here this painting is actually in a video you have on youtube and it's just a huge piece from korkula croatia yeah korkula. And, you paint, and you painted it over five days and i think it's like three by four feet right yeah yes so how long did you paint each day to maintain that light consistency? Because you probably only had, what, maybe an hour, hour and a half max? No, I think, I mean, you know, it's funny painting outside. When I first started painting outside, I really loved the low light in the mornings and in the evenings. And my teacher really loved the low light. And so I sort of, you know, did what he was doing. But if you're painting at sunset or sunrise, you're with that golden light, you know, your effect is very, very short. But these kind of midday paintings, I find you can often paint for you know as long as the whether it's backlit most of my paintings are backlit but so the you know the sun would be from about 10 in the morning the sun's pretty high especially this was in the summer and then you know till maybe one o'clock or two o'clock you could probably work and then the sun would come over and the buildings would light up but then you can still work on the sky or the the water is not going to change that much and I painted, I don't know, a photo of it, but there was a town called Bolpaya that I loved painting. And one thing I loved about it was the, the view was north facing. I was looking due south and you could arrive and the sun would be at sort of 10 o'clock here. And then it would, you know, go to here at about three o'clock and you could work for five or six hours. And, you know, the buildings were just in shadow the whole time. Nice. So you could basically just keep working for... And so I, that was how I first started doing large paintings was there. And having a north facing subject just meant that you could keep working without huge changes. So I think if you're looking at midday light, you often have much longer slots. Mm. It's really the mornings and the evenings that are complicated. Thanks for that. But I encourage everyone just to go have a look at this time lapse. It's just amazing to see. So I think we're going to start with taking some viewer questions. Please start throwing them in the chat. We have some of that already. He's keen amateur, but will have more time to develop uh, his paintings and would like to teach beginners paintings. Uh, teaching is probably, I think, one of the best things you can do to really improve your artwork. But uh, any advice on the best way to move to the next level with my work and start teaching? Um, how to start teaching? Yeah, it's it's not easy. I mean, I remember just being terrified when I started teaching. I was fortunate because I was in a school situation where we would learn uh, drawing and then we would start teach drawing and then we would learn painting and then we would teach painting. So you kind of 
I think that if you could certainly start out with teaching beginners and then, or teaching drawing, uh, presumably you should learn to draw well before you can paint. And so starting out uh, teaching, I think if you're able to teach people who are just starting, I think that's a good way of getting into teaching. I mean, I guess I don't have a ton of experience because I came out of this school where it was all, we were all within the school. So it was hard to, um, I would say, yeah, to start teaching, you want to teach uh, ranked beginners. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And just keep on progressing from there, right? Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for that. Because you're painting a lot of landscapes now, how hard is it to get back into painting from life portraits? Or is it kind of a muscle memory that just comes back? One thing that's happened is, uh, I mean, I've had some important portrait commissions and you know you need a certain studio environment you need uh, a good place to work which I haven't really had access to I find it difficult to you know working in other people's houses is not often ideal but I think and also I mean there's some technical stuff that I've left I mean just answer if it's like muscle memory I think it definitely is like I didn't think I, I struggle and I've painted you know, portraits of my wife over the years or self-portraits and portraits of friends. So I haven't really completely given up, but I completely switched my palette when I paint portraits. So I use a, a lead white instead of a titanium white. I find titanium works much better outside because it's, it's very fast for um, changing fleeting effects that we have in nature. So I really, really love titanium white outside. I hate titanium white inside i mean it's just i really don't like it at all for portraits so i switch back to uh, lead white when i'm doing portraits i also don't use black outside at all and uh, in portraits i use black and so it does take me a minute to readjust to the colors i mean lead white and titanium white there's just a massive difference between the two and yeah so my portrait palette is only four colors my portrait palette is Lead white uh, vermilion, which is very important that the vermilion is exactly the right color because I notice a big difference when it's not. Mm. And right now I'm using Williamsburg paints and they do a cadmium red light. It's like almost a perfect uh, vermilion. We used to get these like top vermilions from that they dug out of an extinct volcano near Siena. Oh, wow. these sort of historic uh, vermilions and the Williamsburg, they call it cadmium red light, I think, because they don't want to confuse people because vermilion is both a color and a pigment. And so they call it cadmium red light, but it's almost a perfect vermilion. So I use that. I use a yellow ochre, also very important that it's right because you're only using four colors. It, the, each color has to be um, perfect. So uh, yellow ochre, I tend to use a warmer yellow ochre, a more orange yellow ochre, which I get from Zeki, uh, but also I think Williamsburg makes an Italian ochre that's quite good or Old Holland gold ochre are quite good. And yeah, so they need to be a, a redder ochre and, and then black. I, I think that today they call it the Zorn palette, but you know, I find that really annoying <laughs> because it was the Apelles. It was like the ancient Greek palette. Oh, and interesting. For thousands of years. And then I've seen that Zorn portrait that they, I think it's in Sweden, Stockholm. And I looked at his palette where he's there with, and there's a fifth, there's an earth red in the middle. And so I completely disagree with this Zorn palette. <laughs> no, 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 that's interesting. Taken off. Everybody calls it that now. And yeah, no doubt. No, that's really interesting. Oh, that just shows my ignorance. I've been just taking it for what it no, is. No, no, everybody calls it that. Yeah, so the color changes are, are complicated, but I don't find it very difficult. I did so many portraits as yeah. a student. I mean, it was like a portraitist factory. We would do six hours a day of portraits for years. So, wow. Um, I don't find it hard to get back. Perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so when you size up your planar pieces, do you do it in increments or you just go from that 11 by 14, 8 by 10 to your 3 by 4 foot piece? No, I usually, um, one thing I find interesting is because I'm sight sizing, the little sketch is often sort of my vision from this distance. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you know, I'm just kind of tempted just to expand out from there because that would be my vision, you know, say at this distance. Yeah which is often where, you know, the distance to your uh, hand or to the, the canvas from your hand. And so then I'm sort of tempted just to have this small sketch be exactly the same size and then just build out from there. 
Yeah, okay. Well, well, much like the example you've shown, right? It's just more landscape. Yeah, more of it. I still think, and to me, I'm also kind of interested in, because I'm interested in this idea of naturalism and painting. So, you know, if what is the most naturalistic sort of angle for a painting? Because what is human eyesight? You know, we have this, not quite 180, but to figure out what would be the most naturalistic landscape. I mean, how much of the landscape do we actually focus on? if you're standing in front of it and how much would you want to reproduce for the viewer later these are kind of things that i've wondered to myself and on what size like you know on a small painting you would want something kind of small but on a big painting do you want a small angle of view or a large angle yeah yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. and which is the more naturalistic way to go oh i love that way i think i never thought of it like that that's just fascinating thank you for that now here's a question on pigments uh, which blues are your go-to for landscapes and or seascapes? I'm using a cerulean blue. I, I get it from this uh, art store in Florence called Zeki. And it's funny because a few years ago, I bought a bunch of these old Holland uh, ceruleans, which are like 200 euros for a big tube. I bought a bunch of them. I have tons of it. And it costs a fortune and it's a beautiful color, but it's slightly too green. So I find that I really much prefer this Zeki cerulean, which costs a fraction of the price. Oh, um, really? Usually that's a cha-ching. Yeah, that's usually a crazy expensive and it's a, just a perfect uh, blue. It's kind of, uh, the old Holland is full of pigment and it's definitely mm-hmm. worth it. And then I really love the old Holland blues in general. So I'm using, oh, so the, to answer the question, cerulean, cobalt, and ultramarine. But I use an ultramarine dark because it's what I use to get my black. I use a cobalt blue, which is a um, uh, also old Holland. The the thing is that a lot of these colors that are crazy expensive, like Old Holland or Williamsburg, they tend to be really, really full of pigment. And so you use much less to mix a color. Now, obviously, right now we've been painting sunflowers because where we live in France is full of sunflowers. And getting out the expensive cadmiums means you're putting on these big impastos of very expensive cadmium, which is kind of a waste. But if you're mixing colors, if you're using, I'll often have a cheap, cerulean and an expensive cerulean on my Mm. palette and if i need to mix uh, a green i'll use the old holland because it's so powerful i only need a tiny bit of it i think i've noticed that a lot of times i would have students who would come with student grade paints and i often when i do my courses i walk around and i take their brushes and and i take their paints and i paint on their canvas and you know i dip it in the paint and put it on the canvas and nothing happens so i have to keep (laughs) getting more and more paint and then you use half of their because the student grade paints don't have a lot of pigment. That's right. And so if you're, you know, if you're not going to be painting a lot, they make sense. But if you're going to be painting a lot, buying the cheaper paint isn't necessarily a good economic value because you're just going to use a lot more of it much faster. Yeah, that's right. Um, so it's something to think about. Yeah, so I use a Zeki Cerulean and then I use an old Holland Cobalt or a Williamsburg Cobalt. And then I use, I really love the old Holland Ultramarine Dark. I have a funny story about it because I used to grind my own paints by hand yeah, for like a decade and a half. I, I would buy the pigments and the oil and I would sit there with my little muller. And one year I, I had some students come to my studio and I wanted to show how my ultramarine was so much better than what you could get out of a tube. Okay. And I had just made the ultramarine, so I put it on the, the canvas and then I got some old Holland dark out and I put it on the canvas and the old Holland was so much darker and richer than my hand ground ultramarine and so kind of realized that there's a lot of boutique sort of uh, paint manufacturers today who are doing you know as long as the pigments are good then the the quality of the paints is superb yeah well you picked you picked the wrong one because I think old Holland has to be the only manufacturer that pushes as much pigment as they can into every yeah. single tube right like it's unbelievable how, how dense that's those colors are right yeah but th- i think there's also there's a suspicion about what they're adding to it and i find their the rest of their colors i can't stand i find them much too okay sp- but i really like their blues so. that's funny i uh, hear i have a great question about site sizing um uh, sh- you know he has challenging when he's doing sight sizing, especially if closing my left or right eye and seeing the shift. So how do you compensate for that? Or you just look at it with both your eyes? Yeah, I'm always using both eyes. I mean, I'll definitely use 
you know, if you're working on a large canvas, you tend to have to do one side of the canvas looking on one side of the painting and then one side on the other. But I don't ever really close one eye. I, I should mention I don't have great eyesight. And so a lot of people tell me they like the way I simplify in when I'm painting landscapes, but it's basically because I'm supposed to be wearing glasses and I'm not. And so everything is kind of simplified already. Um, but I don't tend to close one eye when I paint. I think I need to see uh, with both eyes when I'm. When I'm yeah, painting. yeah. Because really, you're just you're just wanting to place the form on the canvas. You're not necessarily. Uh, when well, you're looking for the horizons and the verticals, you're not necessarily looking to place it vertically on the canvas, and that's where I think the left and right confuse people, right? Uh, for spacing, I usually I often measure just with a brush. I'll take okay. A, a brush and I'll measure the width in nature and then I'll bring it back over. Um, and, you know, when I was starting out with sight size, we did it with casts and we had plumb lines. Mm. And so we did everything. We measured like every little thing with a plumb line. And then, you know, we put our thumbs there and measure, you know, how far is the nose to the side of the cheek and then go back. And you do as much measuring as you can with a brush or with a plumb line or whatever. But then you always have to check it with your eye because no matter what measurement you're using, it's never as accurate as your eye, but it gets you close. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you can flick your eye back and forth and see if it's wrong. Yeah, gotcha. I, at the school, I taught, they did everything with these plumb lines and it was kind of interesting how the students would get so, how I personally too, you get so used to it that it's, you know, one day you have to give it up. It's like the little duckling they give the magic stick to so you can see yeah. Somebody loses the stick. Yeah. Well, you got to start somewhere to learn that process, right? So, yeah. Question here about uh, when you're finding your subject plan air painting, if you go to an unknown location, uh, do you look for a kind of subject you already had in mind, uh, for example, a church or a building or something like that, or do you just go and find whatever comes up that interests you? It's a good question. I, yeah, I've done a lot of trips, you know, to places where I've never been before. I went to India, Rajasthan for two months and painted uh, landscapes. And certainly I think one of the best things you can do if you go somewhere and you have the time is to first just go around with just a sketchbook, no uh, uh, oil paints. I do sketches of almost everything I paint. So I think that's very important to do a little drawing. And so I think if you go somewhere new, just to walk around with a sketchbook, find compositions and then go from there. But I do think that if I'm somewhere that's sort of more uh, familiar but maybe you know a different Italian city or something that I've never been to. Yeah, I think definitely I would go to the church. I mean, I'm kind of uh, I'll do all kinds of weird stuff. I'll Google images. I'll go to postcard stands. See what. The, oh, what the interesting. Are. Um, you know, I'll I'll take anything I can get for jumping off points. But then you know, there's sometimes I go out with an idea in my mind. What I often like doing is I'll go to some place where. I know other artists have been and I'll go with, you know, there I went to, you know, Narni in um, Southern Umbria with, to find the view that Corot painted, but you can't see it anymore. So I painted something else. But I mean, I think it's fun to, we were just uh, in Pin Mill in England where Edward Sego did a lot of beautiful uh, mm. paintings. And, you know, I went to Pin Mill with all these Edward Segos in my head and I was looking for very specific sort of Sego-esque views. So I think that can be a really fun way to to do stuff. I often have people tell me they're uninspired in their own, you know, where they're from. And one thing that I've found when I've been uninspired is to look at what great artists have done before. And that often will, you know, give you an idea to go out. And certainly if you're lucky enough to live somewhere where you had great painters, and then you can go out to the places they painted and, and find inspiration in what they did before. But there's also just you know, compositional ideas. You look at a painting that's slightly similar to maybe something that's around you and you think, oh, so-and-so painted that. It's good to have a, a, you know, good knowledge of art history, but to, to go somewhere and think, oh, somebody painted something similar to that. I always loved that painting. I'll see if I can take this similar subject and make my own version of it with this new location. So, and then some days I just walk around with a backpack full of stuff over my kit and and see what inspires me. I mean, I kind of do, because I do this all the time. I There's just different uh, ways of approaching it. So 
I think you can either just wander around, hope something hits you. You can go out with a clear idea ahead of time. And, uh, and I think they're all fun for in different ways. Yeah, I think those are all great ideas. Can I just say one thing too? I think there's areas that are much easier to find views and those can often be more difficult. So like I was in Norway in Telemark and it was so picturesque. So I would drive and I would just keep, I would see a view, you know, the first kilometer from the house and I would think, okay, well, that was easy. So I'll go another kilometer and see if I can find something else. And then you do find something else. You're like, okay, well, I'll just do another one. And it just keeps getting better and better. And then you've driven eight hours and you never painted. And then at other times you have views where you arrive there and you can't see anything that you want to paint. And mm -hmm. Like I spent six weeks on a game uh, ranch in Kenya. And when we first got there, it was just these like walls of wild olive trees and these red roads. And there was no big views, no views at all. And, and we thought, my God, what are we going to paint here for six weeks? But we really kind of squeezed it for, for views. And I, produce some of my favorite work then so oh that's fantastic now do you do you find when you're out looking for spots and locations do you find yourself looking in one direction more than others like a north facing or west facing yeah et cetera? i i joke about this all the time with my east coast friends because i noticed that in my opinion they all deny it but a lot of the east coast painters paint a lot with the back with the sun to their back and i think a lot of the west coast painters paint much more often looking towards the sun and I think that it's because to express the sort of sense of heat and intense light, often the backlit view works better. And so for me, when I was living in Italy, when I lived in Portugal, when I was in California, I loved backlit views. And right now we're living in the Gers in France and all of the best views are frontlit. I mean, we'll literally drive east for half an hour to scout and then we'll drive back in the morning with the sun to our back to, to look for views, but we won't even look for views backlit. Interesting. Because all of the best views, and I think it's because it's wheat fields and sunflowers, which both look better frontlit. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's and interesting. So, and also for me, it's just much easier, I think, again, because I'm Western painter, California painter, mm -hmm. painting backlit subjects, I find much easier. So if I'm struggling or if I'm in an art contest or something where I have to, you know, if I want to produce something good, just for whatever reason, not take any risks, I'll paint a backlit thing. Gotcha. I, I'm going to have to pay attention to that observation of yours and really see. A lot of professional artists who I uh, share this opinion with completely disagree with me. So for that well, part. truth is in the pudding, eh? I just get on Instagram and find all the East Coasters and all the West Coasters and complain. Or, also, if you look at historic artists, you can see some artists had clear press, uh, preferences. So Yeah. Well, yeah, I know I have a preference for two, for sure. That's yeah. interesting. Uh, just a question about painting your detail, like even with your Croatia painting, your your large one, and the uh, plein air one that you showed us that you enlarged in the studio. I mean, when you got into the grasses, you had quite a bit of detail in there, but not so much detail that it took away from the entire painting and the the impressionistic look of it, for lack of a better word. How do you go about painting that detail without being too overwhelming? I often soften the edges, and certainly in any kind of shadows, and then reduce the value contrast as much as possible. So you want to have okay. values very close together so that it doesn't attract the eye too much. Oh, perfect. Keep, you know, one of my favorite painters is Isaac Levitan. And one thing I talk about when I teach is this idea of distance in painting. So if you look at like Sargent paintings, a lot of his best outdoor work is done up close. And even like he would go to the Alps and he would paint rocks and another painter or something. He wasn't doing these big distance views. And I've seen sometimes he would, and I didn't think they were as successful. I don't know the best. You know. <laughs> no worries. Well, the hours. Um, <laughs> and then you look at someone like Corot and all of his paintings sort of start, Sargent's paintings, like nothing is further away than 30 feet or something. And then Corot's paintings, nothing's closer than 30 feet. And I love both of their outdoor work, but they clearly had a preference for, you know, certain distance in their subject matter. And I always love the work of Isaac Levitan. And one thing I love about his work is that he really manages to have um, foreground, middle ground, and distance that all work in, uh, together and they read really well. That's something that I've always uh, tried to to find. And I tend to walk and drive a lot, just trying to find a view where you have a foreground, a middle ground, a distance at work. All Fascinating. Yeah. I mean, so it is been the hour, so I can't catch up on everyone's questions, but I do have two more. And the first being, what is the best piece of advice you've ever been given? <laughs> um, 
I mean, I think the one of the most important things is just hard work. You just have to paint all the time and and don't get frustrated. Or, you know, if you do get frustrated, I don't know if you've seen this graph I did a few years ago. I think that if you're, you know, you just go through periods of frustration and those are where you can actually grow the most. Because I think often those periods of frustration are when you basically your ability to see and your ability to draw move at different levels. And I think sometimes you can draw better than you can see. And sometimes you can see better than you can draw. And when you can see better than when you can draw, you're going to be in a period of frustration because you can see the problems with your work and you just have to keep working to be able to, you know, get your draftsmanship up to the level where you can fix it. And so realize that doesn't really answer your question. I don't really think I got a one particular piece of advice that uh, has really stuck with me. Okay. Okay. Usually the artists have something that sticks in their head, but I think you've answered my next question, which is what's the best piece of advice you would give someone else? Yeah, I mean, I think, it, you know, oil painting is really just, it's a lot of hard work and working intelligently too. You know, like I was saying about some people love backlit views, some people love frontlit views, some people love close up, some people love uh, distances. I've also seen people who were, you know, brilliant at landscapes and then they're like, okay, I want to go be a portrait painter and they can't paint portraits and they just throw themselves into a portraitist career and it doesn't really work. And some people paint brilliant still lives and some people paint, brilliant, you know, I think you kind of have to, a lot of discovering who you are as an artist is, you know, discovering what you're good at. And that, you know, doesn't mean you can just keep doing the same thing over and over. But I think it's true that we all have preferences and that really you produce your best work if you work with yourself and what you love and what you want to paint. So. I think that's very good advice. Very good advice for sure. And with the hour being up, I just want to say thank you very much, Bart, for doing this interview. It was a long shot when you, I sent that email and I was ecstatic when you said yes. So thank you very much. Okay, I really appreciate me. that. Yeah, I really appreciate me. that. Um, and thank you for everyone who attended. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Thank you for all your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, uh, but I really appreciate you being here. And of course, check out Mark's work at markdalessio.com or find him on Instagram at mark underscore D'Alessio. If you want to learn more about Artful Minds, head on over to artfulminds.ca or community.artfulminds.ca. So with that, thank you very much. Enjoy your French evening tonight. And uh, okay, thank you. Till next time, I guess. Thank you so much. Okay, take care. Thanks. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.